Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. My guest this week is the second returning guest ever, Dan Gingis. Dan is a customer experience speaker, coach. He's got 20 year corporate background at companies like McDonald's, Discover and Humana. He's an author, keynote speaker and podcast host. And most recently, he wrote this book called The Experience Maker, how to create remarkable experiences that your customers can't wait to share. And I can't wait to share it with share you, with Dan. You. Uh, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you, Nick. I am honored. I hear I'm in pretty good company in terms of returning guests, and I will, uh, I'll take my name next to a Hall of Famer anytime. <laughs> I, I just decided not necessarily it was it was the quality, but then it had to go with the shiny shiniest of heads. And I figured that Shep Hyken had a little bit shinier head than you did, but you just were a, a close second. That's a bet. It's because he shoots it every day, and I'm only a you know once or twice a week. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So typically, I ask all my guests, uh, "What's one thing people might not know about you?" And you did share on the very first time that you delivered pizza to good old Michael Jordan. Uh -huh. That was a, a great nugget. Um, my you question, want another one? I, huh? You want another one? Yeah. Well, I, I if you got another one, but what what I want to ask, uh, and what I asked Shep was, if you could have one more one place to eat one more time in Chicago, which I picked St. Louis for Shep, what would you yeah. choose? Wow. I mean, if I were, you know, on my way out and only had a one last meal, I'd probably go to Gino's East for a, a deep dish pizza. And if you ask 10 people from Chicago what their favorite deep dish is, you'll get 10 different answers. But Gino's, Gino's East is mine. <laughs> hey, what would it be? What, what's on the deep dish? Uh, I like the, so Gino's does uh, the sausage patty, which is actually the entire size of the pizza. So it's not crumbles like you'd normally get the little balls. It's like an entire patty of sausage, uh, throw mm. some onions on there, maybe some mushrooms. And I am super happy. Yeah. And full and probably tired after that. So Indeed. Uh, very cool, man. I love it. Uh, I always could go for a deep dish. So uh, let's talk about the book a little bit. I mean, there's, this, this book is full of awesome nuggets. Um, but the first one I want to say is, is there's a, there's probably five or six questions I want to get to, but what's the most common response to a positive experience? Like, you know, when it comes to positive uh, experiences, it's, it's great, but what does that mean? What's the most common response to a positive experience? I think one of the most common responses is that people talk about it. And that's exactly what I'm trying to teach people how to do in this book. You know, I spent 20 years as a marketer and I was in almost every marketing channel that you can imagine other than television. And I sort of honestly got tired of yet another marketing campaign and, oh, great, we got to do another email campaign. And it's just so repetitive. And what I find is that if we can get customers to talk about us and really do the marketing for us, it's way more effective than anything we can do as a brand. And so, uh, you know, to me, the one thing that people do when they get a really positive experience is they tell someone about it. And the reason for that's simple. We don't have very many positive experiences. I uh, love to survey audiences when I keynote and I ask the audience who remembers the last time that they had such an incredible experience with a the brand they couldn't wait to tell people. And no matter how big the audience is, four hands go up, always. Hmm. And then I say, now, who remembers the last time they were disappointed with a brand? And every hand goes up. In fact, the last yeah. time I did that, the guy in the front row leapt out of his seat and said, that just happened this morning. You know, <laughs> so like people remember stuff on the edges. They remember the great experiences. They remember the poor experiences. And unfortunately, the number of great experiences we have is just so minimal. But the fortunate part is that, that therein lies the opportunity for businesses. Yeah. You also mentioned in the book that the bar for customer experiences is so low. Why is that? I think that still so many companies have not become truly customer centric and there's just too many pain points and barriers placed in front of customers to have a really good, smooth experience. You know, I'm a believer that customer experience does not have to be a multi-year, multi-million dollar transformational process. It can be a series of many little things because if we think about it, a lot of the companies that we do business with 
it's a series of many little paper cuts, you know, death by a paper, a thousand paper cuts. Oh man, this doesn't work. Oh, I called and I left, got put on hold. Oh, the agent didn't know what I, you know, know the answer to my question. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't respond on social media, whatever it is, we continue to get these paper cuts. And the reverse is true too, is that we not only can eliminate those one at a time, but we can also start building better experiences one at a time without feeling like we have to take on this incredibly huge project and you know hire a bunch of consultants and you know set aside 20 employees full time to do it for the next 3 years you don't have to do that you really just have to get a culture going that really looks at every single interaction and says how do we make this better how do we make it so that people want to share it and a simple way to look at that is with any experience that you have online or offline, ask yourself, would somebody want to share this on social media? Mm -hmm. Now, normally we ask ourselves, what would happen if somebody shared us? You know, we're scared of them sharing yeah. it on social media. I want you to turn the question around and say, how do we get them to share? What can we do in this part of the experience to make it so that people want to talk about it? And it's not necessarily the goal isn't to go viral. Like, hey, what are we going to do? What kind of crazy thing are we going to do? to get them to share this, but how are we going to create an outstanding, outstanding experience where they're like, I have to share this with somebody and not just the, the neighbor next to me or my friend or spouse or whoever. I have the ability to share it with my connections and with my network. Yeah. And remember folks, when we're talking about sharing, yes, there is the literal sharing of telling your neighbor, telling your coworker, posting on social media, but the people that are doing that are a, helping create awareness of your brand to other people and be most likely going to stick with your business for a long time. So they're also loyal. And one of the concepts I talk about in the book is called the leaky bucket, which most companies have. And that is that most companies have, have customers that are leaving them and not telling them why. And it's this little drip, 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 because they don't leave en masse. They just leave one at a time when they don't when they're not satisfied, when they don't get the answer that they want, when someone else offers them something better. And the idea is, is we need to keep more of those people by plugging the leaky bucket. And we do that by creating great experiences. So we plug the leaky bucket and the bonus is we get them to tell other people about it, building awareness for new customers. So it actually, CX is so powerful that it allows you to do both of those things at once. Yeah, I love the leaky bucket analogy because if you had 10, 20, 30, 50 drops, you, if the bucket's full, you can't necessarily see that there is a difference, but uh, sometimes you don't solve the problem at the very beginning. You, you see that there's a difference or there's a, a pain point or there's a, a chunk to the bottom line because the customers, is already, customers have already left enough where the bucket's noticeably lighter than it was before. Absolutely. And meanwhile, we're so focused on bringing in new customers that we're forgetting about the ones that are already there that are paying our salaries that are keeping the lights on. And we all know it's far easier to keep a customer than it is to get a new one. And it's far less expensive to do that. And yet so many companies are only focused on that front door of new people walking in. And it's a big mistake because when those customers leave, where do you think they're going? They're going to your competition. So yeah. it's a double loss. You've lost the customer, your competition's gained one. That is not a way to run a sustainable business. Yeah. So when it comes to customer experience, is there a CX nirvana or CX perfection? No, because CX, there is no end game. It is the journey. It's not the destination. Because as soon as you think you've made it there, customer expectations are going to change or the world's going to change or we're going to get a pandemic and everything's going to get unwound and turned around and topsy-turvy. Mm -hmm. So there really is no end to customer experience. But I would say the nirvana, the closest nirvana is when you have a culture of customer centricity so that every business decision is being made with the customer in mind. And every employee feels empowered to make the customer's day a little bit better. And that's when you have built it in and it's sustainable and scalable in an organization. So how do you do that? It's, it's easy to say that we just need to have a customer centric focus and we're people have the ability to help customers. Is there, is there a framework or a process to say, you know, you can't, you can't force everybody to be customer centric, uh, but maybe it starts with the HR team and kind of works backwards, or maybe it's kind of a 
holistic approach? Is there, is there an easy button to creating that? that I wish there was an easy button, Nick. However, if there was an you easy would be button, a I'd, billionaire by now, I'd either be a billionaire, or I'd be employed one or the other. <laughs> People wouldn't even need me, right? But no, there's no easy button. But some of the things that I suggest, number one, I suggest that every employee to the extent that they can become a customer of their own company. So I was a very proud Discover card member when I was an employee there for 10 years and I used it everywhere and I earned my cashback bonus and redeemed my cashback bonus and called customer service when I needed them to and asked for a credit line increase and checked my free FICO score and all the things that you could do, I did. And that's how yeah. I observed what was working really well and what needed to be better. Because all of us have that in us because we're all consumers in our real lives. So you may not be a, a frequent credit card consumer, but you understand what a good experience looks like because you're a consumer of lots of other brands. Yeah. So I always made sure that I was really in deep with the product, which I think that every employee should do. The second is that we need to uh, incent every employee as part of their annual review process to be thinking in a customer centric way. What does that mean? It means that even if you're not a frontline employee, let's say you're in the finance department and you never talk to, to customers, you've got to understand that the things that you do in your daily job affect customers. If you increase the price of something or you change the fees of something or you change the different methods of payment that, that customers can pay you with or the amount of time that they have to pay you. If you change your invoicing platform, all of that stuff affects the end customer, even if you're not in front of them every day. Yeah. And so when we're making those kinds of decisions, we've got to be aware of what the customer impact is. I always like to go back to the story of, you know, whoever it was at one of the airlines that, that in the finance department that decided one day that it'd be a great idea to start charging people to check their bags. Mm -hmm. Now for 50 years, they didn't charge people to check their bags until one person figured out that they could make billions of dollars by doing it. Problem? We pissed off all the air travelers, right? And, and I mean, they literally got no value out of it because it was something yeah. they were already getting. So there was a way to, to perhaps add a fee while also adding value. And the flip side of that is you look at Amazon Prime. I dare you to tell me how much Amazon Prime is. I don't know. Nobody knows. All I know is it's raised the price four different times and no one cares yeah. because we pay it every year because they keep adding value to it. Yeah. When you first signed up for Amazon Prime, the whole gig was two-day free shipping. Now that's like the last thing I think about because yeah. I've got I've got Prime Video and Prime Music and you know all of these other access points and value points that when they raise the price again, I'm probably not going to care. And so will millions of people. So that's the difference, right? Both companies charging a fee, one providing a ton of value. One providing zero value because we were already getting that for free and now it's yeah. become a cost. So, and then and then think about how people feel about Amazon versus how people feel about airlines. And you got your answer. So it's, it's not that the airlines couldn't ever add a fee for checking bags. It's that that decision was made unilaterally in the finance department without any regard for the customer. Yeah. So how do you really feel about that? Yeah, got me amped <laughs> up a little bit there, huh? Yeah, I love it. I love the passion, man. Keep it up. So, uh, one of the the acronym you got in the book is is wiser, uh, and and for the life of me, I can't get that nineteen ninety something commercial out of my head at the Super Bowl where the frogs are saying "Bud Wiser," and so it's continuing to stay in my head. So I had to share it. I had to share it online or on the podcast. And it just gave me a chuckle every time I think think of it. But what does it mean to be wiser? Well, first of all, great commercial. And if other people think of that when they read the book, I'm okay with that. That's a that's a, a very memorable uh, commercial for sure. Uh, so wiser stands for witty, immersive, shareable, extraordinary, and responsive. And these are the five things that I believe and have seen in my own corporate career, as well as with interviews of hundreds of other companies. These are the five things that are required to create experiences that people want to talk about. Or as I say in the subtitle of the book, remarkable experiences, literally worthy of remark. 
Now, you don't have to do all five of these. Even doing one of them is going to set your experience apart because as we said before, there are so few really good experiences out there. Most experiences are what my millennial friends like to call meh. And that means ordinary or so-so or average. And so really all we have to do is be a little bit better than that. And we're going to stand out from the crowd. It's not about having to shoot for the moon every time. So the examples that you'll see in the book, and I've got examples for each of these five things in the wiser methodology, they all go through a filter that I really came up with through my experience in corporate America. They have to be simple, they have to be practical, and they have to be inexpensive. Because if they're not one of those things, you're going to get stuck with your legal department or your finance department or your boss or your boss's boss, and you're never going to be able to get any of this stuff done. I want examples that you can look at and say, A, be inspired to go do something similar, and B, feel empowered that you can go do it without having to run through a whole lot of red tape to get it done. And so all of the examples within Wiser should do that. And they're not so that you copy some other company. They're so that you get inspired by what some other company is doing. And you start asking the question, why aren't we doing something similar? Why aren't we treating our customers this way? Why are we doing things like everybody else does it or like we've always done it? And why can't we be just a little bit better than average? So that's what it's meant to do. And uh, again, tons of fun examples. I love them all, but I also love hearing from uh, people like you and others who have read the book, like what their favorite examples are, because the good thing is there's a different one that stands out for everybody. And that's intentional is that as long as a couple of them stand out to you, the reader, then I feel like I've done my job. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the book. There's, there's so many examples I'm not going to continue to stick on the on the podcast. We'll have to do a, a separate one potentially on the on, on the examples. But the one thing that stuck out at me is the word witty. Uh, I didn't really expect that. Uh, yeah. Why is why is there witty in there? And what's maybe some examples of being witty? So besides for the fact that I needed a W word, uh, <laughs> wimmy, waddy, witty, witty, that one. Exactly. That well, witty is not about being humorous. It's not about telling jokes or being a stand-up comedian. Yeah. There's only a few brands out there. I'm thinking Wendy's, Taco Bell, Charmin that have sort of earned the right to do that. And chances are, although I know you have a lot of people listening to this podcast, most of them probably don't work for one of those three brands. So they're asking themselves, well, how do we be witty? Witty is about being clever. It's not about being funny. It's about being clever, using language to your advantage, and refusing to be boring. Hmm. Now, I got to sit in front of a whole room full of lawyers recently during a speech, and I said to them, are you ready for this? There's no law, but I'll bump, that you have to be boring. And of course, it got a laugh, but it's true, right? The yeah. one law firm that isn't boring is going to be the one that stands out because law firms tend to be boring, or at least yeah. they have a perception of being boring. This is true of SaaS companies. This is true of all sorts of B2B industries that are not that exciting. Heck, I worked for financial services and healthcare in my career. Neither one of those would I say are the most exciting in the, in, in the list of industries, but they still can stand out by being witty. And so- uh, a great example of a, a company that was um, witty was, um, God, there's so many of them, but uh, one that I absolutely love is a retailer out of the UK called ASOS. And ASOS made a mistake. They they messed up with one of their packaging bags and there was a small typo in it. They, they spelled the word online wrong. I think two letters were reversed. Mm -hmm. Now, most companies I would argue would have never even caught this mistake because they're just not detail-oriented enough. Anybody, and certainly the companies I worked for, that did catch the mistake would have thrown away the bags. I mean, they would have, oh, we can't have this out there. ASOS instead decided to poke a little fun at, their, at themselves. And they put out a tweet that said, we may have accidentally printed 17,000 bags with a typo. We're calling it a limited edition. Yeah. Now that tweet got so many thousands of retweets and likes and comments that it had to have been one of the best pieces of marketing they did all year long. Mm -hmm. And lots of people who had never heard of the ASOS brand now loved the brand just because it showed some personality. And so is that a hilarious tweet? No, you're not supposed to laugh on the floor or fall on the floor laughing, but it is witty and it's a little self-deprecating and it's clever and it's fun. 
And these are things that today's consumer want from the brands they do business with. They want to see some cleverness, some fun, some humanity. And sometimes just showing a human side can result in what I'm referring to as witty or, or cleverness. What I like about that, the, the bag story, is somebody could have found that one of the bags, taken a picture and posted it on social and saying, look at these idiots, look what they've done. They've misspelled the word uh, online or experience or whatever the word was, and then they look bad. But if they actually take that and use it to their advantage, then they get thousands and thousands of retweets. It's brilliant. It totally is. And you're, you're hitting on a point that I think is so important, which is about being proactive and getting out ahead of things, even things that you may not want to be talking about. One of the companies I used to work for, we literally found out that the website was down on Twitter. Like Twitter would know faster than our IT department would know. Yeah. Now, I remember getting into a debate with the PR team because what I wanted to do was to put out a tweet from the brand saying, we know our website is down, we're working on it, we'll have it back up as soon as we can, we'll let you know. The PR team was really worried about this because they were afraid that we were going to alert people who didn't already know that our website was down, that it was down. Now, I went back and said, hey, they're going to find out one way or another. Yeah. What I don't want them to do is go to the website and find out that they're down. Because if the website, if they find out the website's down that way, the next thing they're going to do, call us, email us, chat with us, tweet us, go on Facebook, and we're going to be using up all these customer service resources to answer the same questions over and over again. Mm -hmm. By getting out in front of it, people understand it, they respect it, and they appreciate being informed. And then they also don't call customer service, yeah. which is great. Uh, so businesses just have to be willing to get out in front of some of the things. Because look, mistakes happen. I believe that customers are genuinely and generally forgiving of companies on the first time, right? You can't constantly mess up. But when companies make mistakes, I think that customers are generally understanding, especially in the last year and a half. I think we've all been a little bit more understanding of each other. That said, getting out in front of it prevents a whole lot of customer contacts and a whole lot of future frustration. Yeah, I, I got a great example. I, there's an energy company here in Ohio that that we use and they the power went out and immediately they sent out a, uh, an email and an automated voice message and a text, uh, depending, I think my wife got something different than I did, but it was proactive and it said, Hey, it looks like we're down in your area. It's going to be approximately 52 minutes or whatever that time was. Uh, we'll keep you updated in, unless something changes immediately. It kind of gives you that peace of mind because if you're in that gray area. Nobody, nobody, no customer is going to say, well, they're, it's probably the best. I'm going to give them the, the benefit of the doubt. And it's probably going to be 10 minutes and I'll wait for them to respond. No, you, you find a way to communicate with them on social and on, on a digital channel or on voice. And it, like you said, it clogs up their customer service department, but it, they, they had that proactive ability to push out that notification, knowing that that's, that's the response of the customer is to, is to react instead of responding. For sure. And yeah, you might hit some customers that didn't know the power was out because yeah. they were at work or they were traveling or something yeah. like that. But that's okay. They're still mm -hmm. going to be appreciative that you let them know. And I love the idea that they're also telling you how long they think it's going to be out. Yeah. You know, do I need to go empty the refrigerator and go put it in coolers? Or is this a short term thing and I just kind of can chill out for a little while? Do I need yeah. to move my home office because I need to work today and I need power? Or you know, can I just walk the dog and it'll be taken care of in a, in, you know, a few minutes. So I think setting that expectation is a really good idea. Yeah. I love it. So what's the most important factor in customers loyalty? Is it, is it NPS score? Is it the, the, Hey, will you refer business to me? Is it, how are we doing? Is it customer effort? What is it? So it is definitely not NPS score. I think that, uh, you know, the, the scores and the numbers that we look at are um, are important because they tell us how we're doing, but they don't tell us why. So our NPS score goes up or down one month and we're left scrambling to try to explain why that happened. And oftentimes we don't know. So we have to combine the numbers with qualitative feedback and what I like to say, because the first two are our voice of the customer, I like to refer to actions of the customer as well. We need to look at the data around how our customer is actually behaving. 
put that all together and we get that bigger picture. But the number one aspect of customer loyalty comes down to removing pain points, to providing a simple experience. And we know that customers easily are frustrated. We stand in their way way too often. And getting out of their way and letting them accomplish what they came to do with us is the easiest way to make people loyal. Yeah. It, it would, it's definitely, I always try to think of it from the consumer's perfect perspective or even my perspective, like, what what would I want in this situation? I think you brought it up at the very beginning, like walking in the customer's shoes is so important. So, you know, speaking of that, what are the pain points most likely in a customer's journey? What are the pain points? Yeah. Well, it all depends. Is it an in-person journey? Is it a digital journey, et cetera? But usually it's when something goes in a way that is not expected. So we go to a website, we fill out a form, and we can't hit the submit button because the submit button isn't working. Well, we expected that it was working. And now since it isn't, that's disappointing to us. That causes frustration. We talked before about death by a thousand paper cuts. Yeah. Is that a reason to leave a company? No. But if stuff like that happens over and over again, you start thinking, maybe I just find a company that makes my life a little bit easier, right? There's stuff that happened in the credit card industry all the time. And I've written about this, about how uh, companies need to be aware of their whole ecosystem. So today there still exists the problem that lots of customers freeze their credit uh, uh, reports because that's a smart thing to do. It's a great way to protect your identity and to um, you know prevent people from applying for credit in your name. However, when you actually do want to go apply for credit, it's like the banks don't even know that this service exists because nowhere in the process does it say, hey, Dan, before we check your credit report, if you have it frozen, you might want to unfreeze it. Yeah. And nowhere in the process does it say after Dan got rejected for his account, that the reason he got rejected was because we couldn't access your, your credit file since it was frozen. Like we all, we know that's the answer, but we're not yeah. communicating that with the customer. And so these are the kinds of things that drive people nuts. I, this happened to me, that actually did happen to me when I was applying for a corporate credit card for my business. Guess what? I went to a different bank and got the card from someone else. I mean, what a bummer, right? They, I, I had already picked the bank I wanted to go to and because they made it so difficult for me, I decided I didn't want to bank with them and I wanted to go somewhere else. This is how easy it is. And I think one of the things we all have to remember is that in almost every industry, except for maybe your monopoly uh, energy company, the switching costs are so low. It's yeah. so easy today to switch phone service providers, cable providers, restaurants, retailers, dry cleaners, lawyers, it, dentists. It's so easy to just find another one. And yeah. so the, if you want your customers to stay with you and not be asking or thinking about going somewhere else, we need to make sure that we're not constantly getting in their way, constantly frustrating them and constantly putting up barriers to them accomplishing what they want to do. Yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, the, the cost of of moving from one group, one company to another uh, is is the barrier is reduced or has is not even there anymore from electric companies to cable companies. Sometimes they're a pain in the tail to to move from to the next cable company. But, you know, it's it's so easy to move from one company to the next. You know, the last question I got for you, if you could explain somebody who's never seen this book, uh, what the heck this book is about in 30 seconds or less, what would you say? This book teaches you how to create customer experiences that your customers want to tell their friends and family and social media followers about. It's a book that teaches you how to not be ordinary or average or meh, but to be better than ordinary, better than average, better than meh, and therefore remarkable. Boom. I think it was definitely under 30 seconds. Uh, well done, my friend. Uh, what's the best way for, for my listeners to get, a, get in front of you? DanGingis.com. You can find everything there uh, as well as all of my socials and stuff are linked there. And uh, for people interested in the book, go to the experiencemakerbook.com. We've got some special bonuses for people ordering in the first two weeks. Uh, so check them out and enjoy. Yeah, not only that, but this new season of the podcast came out. Uh, give a quick uh, few second plug of that. 
Sure. Experience This is now in season eight. It comes out every Tuesday morning. And we do two seasons a year. We sort of follow the school year. We do a fall and then a spring season. We take the summer off. And we are 130 some odd episodes in. It's a really fun show. All we do is share customer experience stories and talk about them. Uh, no interviews, but really the two of us kind of getting digging deep into why certain experiences work. I love it, man. Thanks for your time, Dan, and best of luck. Uh... Uh, with the top of the charts with the experience maker how to create remarkable experiences that your customers can't wait to share thank you nick